right now as a reminder to myself, the session is being recorded. So I know sometimes folks turn up and unfortunately maybe you can't make the last five, 10 minutes or so, um, but we do host the video on our Reimagine WAED website. Just a reminder, um, you know, I, I love following Sam on Twitter. If you are an educator on Twitter, I will move my head out of the way slightly. Uh, there's a reminder of Sam's handle as well as Sam's website. So thanks, a few folks just turned up. So I am putting that link for the slides there for you again. Um, I'm also gonna post, um, cause Sam, I don't wanna put you on the spot to sort of humble brag, but for those of you who are regular readers of Teaching Tolerance, uh, we feel really honored to host Sam. Sam is one of the 2020 Teaching Tolerance Award recipients. It's a huge deal. Um, and I've just, I've really, really appreciated following your work and it feels like such a privilege to get to learn from you today. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, thank you again for making time and, and thanks folks to our audience for joining us for today's session. Sam Long. Thanks, Trisha. I'm really happy to be here with y'all. Um, th thank you for introducing me. I'm so glad that so many educators and I see a lot of science teachers have come in and made it a priority to learn about teaching about diversity in science. So I'm gonna do a presentation that I think is gonna be about 60 minutes or a little less. I'd love for you to uh, put thoughts, wonderings, questions and comments in the chat while we do that. And I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, so this is called Discovering Diversity in Science Education. I'm a high school science teacher near Denver, Colorado. I mostly have taught biology and chemistry, so mostly ninth graders as it's turned out. And you can follow me on Twitter right there at SamLong713. So as we teach science, we are thinking a lot of things. We're thinking, is it my job to teach about diversity? Is it my place to do that? How will I fit this into my curriculum, all the things that I'm doing? And will my principal back me up on this? Um, how's it gonna go down? Am I gonna be able to really help students if I, um, lose my position next year or I'm not able to teach what I want to teach. And so all of that goes through our heads as science educators. Our goal or our goal for the purpose of this session will be to teach about diversity in, in science and scientists for the purpose of helping all students find enjoyment, success and belonging in science classes from K to 12 plus. Science identity is at the heart of what we're looking at here. How, how does your relationship with science, how you see yourself in the science classroom, um, impact your experience there? And that matters for all students. Um, it mattered for me as a child of scientists. It's like a, a chosen one. I felt like I was born to study biology. My parents did it. We all talked about it. Uh, and then I got to high school biology and we're talking about genetics in a way that completely erases my identity as a young transgender man. And it also comes in for students who don't feel like they have any place in science. No one in their family has really had much connection with that and they just don't feel like it's something that they're good at. So a lot's been written on science identity, a lot's been done. I want to share with you an activity that I really like, which is called the My Lab Bench activity. And this was developed by River Sa, who's a colleague of mine with Gender Inclusive Biology. This is uh, something that probably is best done at the beginning of a unit of study about developing science identity. I'll show you basically what the students see and all of the resources are at this blue link right here. So a lab bench is where a scientist does their work, right? In a physical space or a virtual space, it's where you do your work. And we know that professional scientists, that's often personalized, they put up things on their cork board, they set it up the way they like it. And in this activity, students do the same thing. They do it within a Google slide. So just like the one I'm showing you here, and I'll show you my example of my lab bench. I have on my uh, chalkboard, my name and my pronouns and encourage students when you do your own, I'm highly encouraged to put your pronouns and say why that is. I have a bunch of like clip art slides that students can drag on to here. And for me, I've chosen, I'm gonna highlight three main objects on my lab bench that highlight my science identity. Um, first are these flags, Colorado and Canada, the places that I've spent most of my life and where I felt like I've developed the most as a scientist and as a person first growing up mostly in Canada 
and then coming to Colorado to begin teaching and really felt like I was making that transition from, uh, I guess, a, a young person to an adult there in Colorado. Um, over down here, I have a, oh, oops. I have a t-shirt that I have in real life. It has the trans pride colors and they're in moon phases and it says not a phase. I identify a lot with that t-shirt. I wear it a lot when I can, because to me, the notion that being trans was a phase, the notion that that, that part of my identity was valid um, really hindered me developing as a young scientist. I was a teenager when I came out as transgender and my parents just generally thought this is a phase and it's, if you go too far into it, it's going to interfere with like your academics and your life and you know you wanted to study science. And when I met this person over here, Dr. Ben Barris, uh, that's when my perception of that changed. He, Ben Barris was a neuroscientist at Stanford. He passed away just a couple of years ago. And when I was in college, I sent him an email just out of the blue. I had seen one of his videos on YouTube and I said, hey, I'm a young trans man. I'm studying physiology. Um, I don't know what to do because my mom thinks I should be a doctor. She thinks that like if I'm my own boss, no one can like fire me for being trans. And I think I might want to go into education instead. What should I do? And his response was, uh, this was really cool. He, he didn't know me at all. And he typed uh, many paragraphs to me. And at the bottom, it said, written on my iPhone. And I thought, wow, this guy must really care about me. He it takes a long time to type on an iPhone uh, to give me this advice and encouragement, which basically said, um, do what you want to do. Um, you're going to be happy if you're doing what you want to do. And uh, I encourage you to be out about being trans and to be open. And in his experience, it had been positive. Um, his experience kind of mid-career uh, coming out and transitioning. And there I was kind of on the brink of deciding what my life was going to look like for the rest of, I don't know, 50 years. And that encouragement inspired me to start being more out instead of being worried like about when I would talk about being trans and if I would be accepted in science or uh, as a teacher or in any field, I gradually started to develop more confidence around that. And I started to realize, you know, whether we're dealing with scientists or educators or young people, everybody has this same notion of identity, right? Almost everything that we do is to express, develop, or to reinforce our identity. And so I would share this it's a long story for my lab bench, but he his picture is on my lab bench because Ben Barris is my mentor as a scientist and as a trans person. Um, another thing on my lab bench, there's a whole bunch of other stuff, but this is a, a paper. If it's, it's really small, but it's from 19, uh, 1989. This is a, a paper in cell motility about pollen tubes in plants. And what's significant about it is that this is the first paper that my mom published. My mom uh, was or is a cell biologist and her and my dad moved from China, uh, immigrated or uh, first came to the United States as graduate students. And my mom studied pollen tubes. When I was a kid, I had no idea why that would be so relevant. Why would someone spend so much time on this one thing? Do we even know it exists? What is it? Um, but as I grew up, I started to realize, well, for me, science was at the core of my family. Science and, and this pursuit of research is why I am an American. It's why I am here and it has informed my entire life. I would not have the same life as a trans man growing up in China. I wouldn't have the same life if my family had focused on any other interest, any other pursuit than science. And so I have that up on my virtual lab bench here. And I put all this here to show that we all have identity, our identity as a whole. A lot of it may relate to our identity as scientists and as science students. 
just into another example, this is just a fictional person named Joel. And so his don't have to be as heavy as mine, um, but he's got an aquarium because he's really interested in oceans and living things in the ocean. He's got a Colorado flag because he's a Colorado native. I don't know if other states do that, but a lot of people really care about being Colorado natives in terms of identity here. And he's got a microscope because he is really interested in looking at the fine detail of all the science that he studies, um, being very meticulous and analytical in everything that he does. And so the assignment here, the task for students is to create their own lab bench containing at least three elements of science identity. Could be something very, very general like a Colorado flag, or it could be something very personal like a picture of somebody that inspires you as a scientist. And so when students do this, they're gonna get a blank, a blank slide deck and they get to copy over images. If you go to um, this link here, I put a bunch of images and inspirational posters, uh, objects that I thought most students would want. Um, just to show, I didn't say you have to use those objects, but just to show all the different possible objects and physical holders of meaning uh, that could inform our identity as scientists. So that's half the project for my lab bench. Your task as a student is to create your lab bench. Uh, students generally have a, a lot of fun with this, uh, picking what they want there, um, sharing just as much as they want to. And, and I usually also have them share with their classmates. I'll say, well, we're going to do a sharing this time. If there's something you don't want your classmates to see, if it was um, just personal, you can remove it out of this version and we'll share. We'll each go around and be able to see each other's lab benches. The second part of my lab bench is to think about diverse scientists and how they also have this lab bench, this set of identities, set of objects that are close to them that express who they are. And so I give a little list of diverse scientists. And the example that I made was for Franklin Chang Diaz. It's a very simple kind of requirements for research. We're not going in depth into research here, but we're going to find out when they were born, roughly what time they lived in, their identities, which ones matter to you. Um, this person, I didn't put every identity he's got, but I thought it was really relevant based on his profiles and his interviews um, that he was from this large biracial family uh, in Costa Rica. Summary of his uh, achievements over here. And then this is the really fun part. What objects do you think he would have on his lap bench, an astronaut for NASA. So I thought probably a globe because as you are in space, you see all of Earth. And I've always heard, you know, have this big overview effect of how you see the world when you are in space. Of course, a picture of him, um, probably one of the proudest moments of his life to be an astronaut and to have his family see him make it to that point. And then a telescope for studying the stars when one is not in space. And so every student makes um, their own lab bench and learns a little bit about a diverse scientist. You don't need to learn about really everything in someone's life. And we'll talk more about how diverse scientists can fit into a science curriculum. But what matters is we're thinking about this person's perspective, what identities are important to them, um, what they did, sure, but and how they would express their identity in the way they maintain their space, their lap bench. So I hope that you'll consider a lab bench activity maybe at the start of your next semester. Uh, I'll tell you that students really like being able to build this and they learn a lot when it comes to the diverse scientists, uh, especially if you make sure you're not um, something that I noticed a lot is if I even put one person that students have researched before, like, oh, in eighth grade, we all learned about Henrietta Lacks, um, that, not a scientist, but for example, um, they would all pick that because uh, maybe they have a motivation to just, instead of learning about someone new, do, some, do a project they've kind of already done, or like, we all learned about uh, Albert Einstein, let's say. So I try to make it really diverse and uh, novel to them. And I'll show you more of my thoughts about um, studying famous or diverse scientists in a bit. I love that idea, Sam. And even, you know, what I'm realizing that's novel to me is 
just the notion of working on your identity as a scientist and the power that that has for our learners. You know, a few weeks ago, we had Julia Torres on the program talking about how students need to see themselves as readers and they need to see their reader identity evolving. Um, and I realized, you know, when I was growing up, I think I worked on my reader identity a little bit because I was really passionate about reading and literacy. But the idea that, you know, I might have thought more carefully about my identity as a scientist. I think if I even just practiced stepping into the shoes of what are some of the things that interest me, you know, when it comes to the world of science, um, you know, in what ways do I actually see myself as a scientist? I definitely think that step alone would have motivated me so much more. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that, Tricia. And what you said reminded me of, um, I just wanted to show you some of the uh, the, the possible objects that you can make available, the kind of the general um, uh, books, computer, chairs. I put the, the hard hat. Um, for some students, it's really about hands-on. Uh, I don't want to be making a computer program to analyze the DNA. I want to be doing something hands-on. And we see that here. We'll have students that really, they want to go to computer science. They really care about medicine. It's about connecting with people and patients in that case. And so when you make that available, just, just a small slice of the possible ways that science identity could look in your lab bench. Um, I think that helps students to, to think about that. And they don't need to think of like, well, reasons I'm not good at science. They can think about reasons that science really uh, relates to me and rates, relates to my life. And of course, uh, fun posters, some of which are very cheesy, but students like them. I mean, to us, we've heard the same jokes many times, but to them, um, even the corniest thing is very funny, or they appreciate it. All right. Um, so that was about science identity, the lab bench. And next, I want to think about science language. What are the ways in which we express our knowledge, our questions of science? And how does diversity come into that? None of the thoughts that we have about science, about understanding our world, our thoughts don't have a language, right? We have chosen words to describe everything that we want to communicate to other people. And so if you ever teach biology, one suggestion that I have is to think very carefully about the way we talk about gender, sex, and sexuality in biology. It's gonna come up a lot. You're gonna talk about reproduction, um, sex education, genetics, uh, meiosis, hormones. And this is a small section of an article that we published on We Are Teachers. And this is, encourages us to, instead of talking about um, what belongs to men and women, what is the domain of men and women, to focus more on precise language that serves a purpose. And so if we are talking about meiosis, you can say ovaries produce eggs. There isn't a need and there's not a justification to say um, probably what most textbooks say, which is women produce eggs. We need our students to understand that, well, not all women have ovaries. And sometimes it has to do with um, medical traits and sometimes it has to do with uh, gender and transition or intersex traits. But just for the purpose of talking about meiosis, I'm just gonna say ovaries produce eggs that gives us the language that we need to understand this precisely without making any generalizations that leave somebody behind. And this is something that you would think, um, sometimes I thought it would be too confusing. Like I need to say is men and men is this and women is this, I'm gonna lose some of the kids otherwise. Um, but students get it. They understand it's the ovaries that produce the eggs. I haven't had it happen that students kind of wanted to go back to a, a more generalized or overgeneralized language. And for them, they are now taking folk knowledge, like knowledge you've heard, and making that precise and refining that in their science class. And they want to do that. They want to learn the precise truth. They want to learn the evidence-based truth after having kind of just overheard various things about sex and reproduction over the years. Similarly, if you were talking about uh, prostate gland, maybe in health class, uh, people with a prostate gland should get it checked annually. It's not 
helping anybody to say, well, men should get the prostate check. You're going to exclude some people. And also you're making your language and your communication less precise. And so by talking about this, we can express the fact that all people, both cis and transgender, experience different bodies, reproduction, and families. Not to say that, well, I'm just going to say men for this. You kids all know what I mean. No, they don't know what you mean. Um, when you say, well, or as most textbooks, a, a lot of even modern YouTube videos would say, well, it's the women that have two XX chromosomes. Um, what a student is hearing, a student who is LGBTQ or a student who is intersex or a student that even has loved ones that have some of those identities, what students are hearing then is, um, I either don't understand about those identities or I'm a teacher that doesn't have the time to honor my students. And of course, we don't wanna be in that situation. This small changes in language, our students really notice. I'll share some um, feedback from students at the end of here on um, kind of what students have taken away mostly from some of these tweaks that I've made to simple language and talking about science and identity. Similarly, when we look at hormones, it's very often that students don't know until we talk about it. They don't know that they have both estrogen and testosterone. Everybody's got both. Um, they've grown up thinking testosterone, it's what makes men want to drink Gatorade and be strong. Um, both are involved in a lot of processes, most that don't have anything to do with um, sex or gender. And it's just the ratios and the uh, profile over time of each hormone that will determine our physical development. Students haven't seen gender, um, among other things, as something complex, as something that's a spectrum. They've understood it as a binary, which we now know is not supported by science. And there's a lot of justification for helping our students learn that as well. One way I like to talk about language is root words. And I've encountered teachers uh, like English, ELA, ELD teachers that some really, really liked that. And some thought, well, etymology is, you know, it's old root words from Latin, it's not functional. But I think in science, it really is functional. And it's because when you look at science words, they you don't have to memorize most words. You can go by the root words to understand what they mean. And if you can start to see how those root words occur in non-science language, you are even better off. And so this is like A through D of the science or STEM equity etymology posters that I've put together at this link here. We've got ad meaning toward. That ad and advocate is the same as the one an ally, except they took out the D at some point. It's the same as an adhesion water molecules adhering toward a surface. And in addition, that bi in gender binary, the bi in binomial, the bi in bipedal and biceps meaning two. And when students start to see this, I always have some students that they get really into it. Um, they will ask, is that the same root word as in this? Um, what are the other words? I found some more um, I wanna share. And when we show that the language of identity of equity of humans is related to the language of science, I think it helps students come to terms with both. Homo and hetero comes up a ton. Um, if you teach any biology or chemistry, physical science, it comes up a ton. Homo meaning same, hetero meaning different. And so some of the ways that you can use these posters or just root words in general one option would be to place it on walls, physical walls, or just the background, like the, the background of my Zoom. Um, maybe, I don't know, you could have four tiled, or sometimes I do one and I switch it every couple of days. And it's just there. You're not talking about it. It's not the focus. Okay, everyone has to learn what hetero means, but it's there. And we know those words come up and it starts conversations. You can use this to pre-teach vocabulary as well. If I know that we're going to talk about homeostasis or uh, homogeneous mixtures, I might do a warm-up question asking, where have you heard these words, homo and hetero? Tell me where you've heard them. Don't be afraid of saying a bad word. We'll talk about what it means, and then we'll see how it relates to this new lesson today.
you can integrate this in an end of unit review. So this would kind of be the opposite of pre-teaching vocabulary. Um, sometimes at the end of the unit, when you look back, you can see how all, all of the terms fit together. And so I've had students do a, a self-paced review where any vocab word that I decided was um, that belonged within the review, they needed to understand their etymology, maybe in terms of a definition or just connecting to multiple words that included that uh, part of the word or that root word. I also always encourage students to share their own examples. Um, I really love the last time this happened was in science in biology, we were talking about anabolic, anabolic and catabolic reactions and a student said, well, if that's anabolism and catabolism, then what's metabolism? And so great connection. Um, we looked into that and students are more interested in things that other students ask than any question that I ask. Um, so it's always welcome for students to share those examples. I really love those examples, Sam, and they're reminding me of, uh, there's a newsletter that I subscribe to called The Art of Noticing. And so I think it comes out every week and it just has some different provocations around teaching us sort of that lost art of noticing and really focusing on things. And I think that, you know, the posters that you have so kindly shared with us, and again, the link to that is in the chat. Um, what an amazing resource not just from that science perspective and, and also not from just that equity perspective, but also that curiosity that you've sparked and that noticing that you have prompted. I just think the more that we can be doing that in education, helping our students really dig in and enjoy that fine art of noticing, there's real power in that. So thank you for sharing those resources. That's cool. I haven't heard of that, the art of noticing. I need to check that out. I'll send you the link. Yeah, it's a, I'm a big newsletter nerd and that's kind of one of my favorites. Cool. Yeah, I think when you notice um, words that have things in common, you wonder whether there's a reason they have these things in common. It, it changes it from a game of, oh no, it's science. I have to memorize 15 things today. It changes to uh, kind of a mystery that I want to solve in some cases. I want to understand what these mean and why we keep seeing these same patterns coming up. So I'm gonna go back to diverse scientists now. And then after I'll talk a lot more focused on biology and a bit of chemistry. Um, we have diverse scientists and we have, even in my district's pre bot like canned curriculum, which I'll say um, is not of highest quality. Uh, there's some attention to, hey, students should learn about diverse scientists and their contributions. Uh, but it's difficult to do that, right? We have all our other standards. We have our NGSS, we have our curriculum pacing guides. And so I've thought about some ways I think are most effective to do this. What our goal is really, it's not learning about random people for, for the sake of learning about them, but this is a part of identity. We wanna show students that, hey, anybody can be a scientist. And we also want them to appreciate the contributions of particular individuals and how they fit into our everyday world. Um, if you ask somebody, what did Einstein do? Um, they may think it's something to do with space. They might struggle to say what it has to, how it affected um, anybody else besides Einstein and his colleagues. Um, so we're trying to bridge that gap here. Um, one option is to just use posters as visual culture. And if you click that link, that's actually the Google image search for diverse scientists. There's just so many different sources for them. Some are high quality, um, some are really high DPI, and some might not look that good printed on a full sheet of paper or bigger. And so decide what, what works best for yourself over there. But the visual culture, uh, students notice that. Uh, sometimes if it's in a physical classroom, students don't want to be looking at their teacher or their paper or up front all day. They will look elsewhere. And if you make sure that something is there that hey sparks this idea, oh, I didn't know there were so many women who are scientists, for example, that they will see that and that will change the culture of the room. Another option, uh, if it's going to be 
learning explicitly about diverse scientists needs to be continual integration rather than one-off lessons. Uh, it's not going to help students very much to spend a day or even a couple of days doing this one project um, where they pick a diverse scientist and then um, they're done with it and then they submit it. My thinking for this comes from um, when I was in eighth grade and myself and two of my friends, we did a famous mathematician project about um, Admiral Grace Hopper, the computer scientist. And so I remember that she's a computer scientist and I remember that she was in the Navy. But what I most remember was um, we, the, the three of us getting together in my basement and filming a, a silly video where we did a, a seance to, to conjure up the uh, spirit of Grace Mary Hopper. And it, it was it was not integrated with the math, right? We weren't in a place where we could quite understand what um, Grace Murray Hopper did in the context of math. And so that I walked away from that feeling, well, it wasn't that effective. We didn't really understand how these things connected to our work. And so it was kind of finish it and you're done. And that's not the best way for students to learn about diverse scientists. This continual integration, uh, it can look like a couple of things. I, it's always difficult. And I'll say that I am not, I, I am not at this point talking about every scientist I want to talk about that I like send an email to myself in the middle of the night saying, we got to do this. Thing. I got to connect it to this scientist. I, I don't always get to that, but I have some suggestions for pacing and how to do that. I think at the beginning of any semester or year, it helps to annotate your syllabus with opportunities to spotlight scientists. When is this going to come up organically? Who in this list, and it doesn't have to be all of them, who's going to come up and when are we going to be able to point that out and to learn a bit, a bit about who they were? Remember, throughout the year, you can harken back to that idea. Hey, remember students, we talked about science identity. Let's look a little closer into this person's identity because they um, discovered the thing that we're looking at. Before I go off this suggestion list, we need to include that living scientist. It's not good enough to show them, um, here, oh, here's the one very well achieved um, black woman physicist. Um, that doesn't inspire much uh, prospect for all our students being able to be scientists. There are living scientists doing anything you could want them to do in any area of research. If you use Twitter hashtags, um, one of them is black in STEM. Pretty much anything in STEM, um, you'll find a lot of people that are openly talking about their work, and that's always appreciated. There is a bit of research on this thing called a science spotlight homework assignment. And this is something that it's meant for science for students to be looking at throughout the year, but it says like periodic homework assignments. And there is some research detailing the effects of that. And so if you're interested in doing something as homework, I know you might not be in a place to do that and have a different homework, but that would be something to check out because it is research based. So here's how I would map out my year. Whoops. Okay, uh, this is not my scope for a year, but it's roughly similar to my scope for a year. And so I'd start with looking at cells, biochemistry, then genetics, evolution, and then well, actually uh, first I would do ecology and then evolution, and then lastly, body systems. Uh, but here's the scientist that I would reliably am able to integrate into some of these units. And so start in the first unit, cell biology. This is all kind of written out in a much messier way in a Google Doc, um, but I tried to make it more, more readable here. When we talk about cell biology, the thing students are always missing, um, they're learning about cells and all the stuff that's in cells. They don't get a single idea of what a cell, like not a round blob cell, but an actual differentiated cell in the body does. And so one way that we address that is we look at the common ones, skin cells, brain cells, muscle cells. Um, what are the technical terms for those? One of those is going to be neurons, your brain cells. And so when we talk about Ben Barris, which my students have already heard of, um, he's the guy that was my mentor that um, told me not to 
give up and to be open. Uh, but he's a neurobiologist, a biologist that specifically studies neurons. And to be more specific, he focused on glial cells. Glial cells, we know all cells have a function. For glial cells, they're not the ones that, they're not actually sending the electrical messages in the brain, but they are supporting the cells that do send the messages. He spent um, his life understanding the glial cells. Why are they there? If they don't seem like they're sending the messages, what makes them so important? And so there we get to see the actual diversity of all the cells that are in the body and the kind of the architecture, the way that they're connected. After a typical unit in cell biology, um, it, it's not so important to me anymore that students know all the organelles, the ribosome, the lysosome, um, the mitochondria probably yes, but um, they don't need to know all of them. What they need to know at first is what are some of the cells? What are some of the things that they do in a way that they can understand? And so it might be really difficult, but if you take just one example, like glial cells connected to a scientist who's really worth discovering and understanding his life's work, um, that really adds a lot of color and a lot of shape to the cell biology unit. And I, I really even just appreciate your framing around, you know, thinking about context, thinking about the scientists that are really relevant, um, you know, to, to our world today, and who are the scientists that really deserve that attention? Uh, who are some of the scientists who, you know, our students and our learners maybe are not hearing about? I really just love that framing. Um, I think that's such a great question for anybody teaching science to be thinking, you know, I have a great opportunity because for some students, hey, our, our science classroom might be the only time that they are coming across scientists. So if we have this lone opportunity, who are the scientists that are the most important? And you know, what values are we placing when we're determining important? Who might we be spotlighting this year if we you know, kind of only have this chance? I really appreciate that question, Sam. Totally, we, we don't have uh, just an endless parade of opportunities to look at individual scientists. But within each unit, I'll try to get in one that we're looking at in a meaningful way. And when it comes to um, biochemistry, well, I can do a lot of demonstrations about water, about carbohydrates and lipids and even proteins, but nucleic acids, I've always really struggled. Like, I generally just tell them, well, nucleic acids, they're there, they're DNA and RNA, and that's all. Uh, but the structure of DNA, which most of them have seen, um, probably agree it's an elegant, beautiful double helix structure. How do we know that? We've taken that for granted that we know that when it was one of the most contentious things um, back in the day that Rosalind Franklin, who worked on using X-ray patterns to figure out DNA's structure. Um, her story, I guess I would consider it a forgotten story, but a recovered story and talked about relatively often now, the way that she was not credited for her role in the discovery of DNA's structure. Some students have heard of it. They'll say, oh, wasn't it like uh, these two men stole her work or um, they didn't give her credit and then they kept all the money or something. And so we, we look at the original paper and the evidence. Um, we look at that, that image of the X-ray diffraction pattern. Most people look at that, they have no idea what it means, but it's one of the most famous pictures in biology, the pattern that was used to support this idea that DNA had a double helix structure. When I go on to genetics, uh, there's a lot of opportunity here to talk about like the language of variation. I showed you earlier kind of a chart of language considerations to take, especially when talking about gender and also with uh, race and disability. All of those are variations within human genetics. We want to talk about the way that genetics determines part of our identity, but not all of it. I, I don't think I have like a specific scientist that I highlight here actually for genetics. Um, later on, when we look at ecology, Rachel Carson is somebody that I, I mentioned. Students today, they generally have 
the idea that well, some things humans do hurt the environment. And for them to see that at the time of Rachel Carson with DDT, this pesticide, there was such um, denial, complete denial of that this thing might be harming our ecosystems. That's sometimes new to them. Um, we look at the way that the voices of scientists, um, some scientists may have the opportunity to really shine and to be experts and to have voice on what they know, what is their area of expertise. And sometimes that has been erased. In body systems, my favorite thing to talk about is blue baby syndrome and heart surgery. These are uh, babies that it's actually not too uncommon. Uh, babies that soon after they're born, they show signs this kid's really not getting enough oxygen. And most hospitals will have someone specializing in that. They know what to do. They know what kind of surgery they need. They know how to detect this really quickly. And it was uh, Vivian Thomas, uh, African American man. He wasn't a I don't he wasn't a heart surgeon, but he was an assistant who developed this heart surgery. Um, there's a biopic called Something the Lord Made um, featuring this story. And he's somebody that did not get credited at all in his time for developing this surgery that saved a lot of babies' lives. The work of scientists sometimes looks different from present day or from our perspective compared to what they were doing at the time. And I want to show students that well, here's five or six examples throughout the year of scientists who, you know, in their life, they were doing their thing. They were focusing on what really drove them, what made them passionate, what was interesting to them. And here we are looking back, seeing a small slice of their life from our perspective in modern day and seeing how what they've done has contributed to this gigantic story of biology, what we know about living things. And so... In the end, that's where the diverse scientists fit in. They, they show that anyone can be a scientist. The science uh, affects identity and identity affects science. And they show that everything that we read, if we look back on what we've done all year, um, we may have learned it all in a year, but look how many person hours, look how much time, look how much passion went into creating this body of knowledge that we now get to build on. All right, um, so I want to now show you a framework that I've developed for gender inclusive biology. I do believe it can be used in any uh, subject area, but this is a way that I look at adapting any existing curriculum for inclusion and diversity. I'll show you a lot of examples through the lens of gender, um, some through other lenses. But the general parts of the framework are authenticity, continuity, affirmation, anti-oppression, and student agency. Rather than going through all this text, we've been able to distill this. We have the technology. Um, so for authenticity, asking yourself the question while planning, is this accurate or oversimplified? For continuity, do I have a consistently inclusive lens or is this a special token lesson? I mean, there's a lot of noble spirits and a lot of special token lessons, but is it worth your time as an educator with a lot to do? For affirmation, do we normalize or do we stigmatize diversity? For anti-oppression, do we empower versus marginalize? And this is a, a big one. This is a heavy one. There's a lot of work in anti-oppression. And also student agency. Do we invite sharing student experience? So I'll show you a couple of examples of how some of these guiding questions, these five parts of the framework, may look in practice. This came from an article that is linked over here in the assembly, which is the uh, C. Boulder Graduate, Sc Graduate School of Education Journal. So we'll start with authenticity. As teachers, we need to reflect on our knowledge and comfort level with topics. We need to start small or big at the place that 
make sense for us with urgency, but at our own pace and making intentional changes. They're a part of the lesson, not in the footnotes. So one of the first ways that I did that um, in my first year teaching biology was we had this text, all these resources. It always says um, a person's got 23 chromosomes or 23 pairs. Um, in each pair, one comes from the father and one comes from the mother. And I just went through and changed that language. I um, photoshopped it out of our packet, really, and used other language. Um, I think the first year it was chromosome from egg versus chromosome from sperm. And I found that that really, that was enough that I, I didn't feel like I would have to justify and like say all this about the reason we made that change. It was precise, it was accurate, that was it. And in talking to my students, that that was also the first year that I was out as trans as a teacher. And so I, I prioritized this because I knew well, if I talk about egg and sperm coming from women and men and the chromosomes determine the sex, um, I know I'm going to have students that are thinking, um, well, isn't it more complicated? I thought like you were one of those people for whom it's more complicated. Um, and I didn't want to be teaching something that wasn't even true to myself. I knew it wasn't true for all my students. And I knew it would just cause a lot of misconceptions in the future. For the element of continuity, we want to begin with a diversity lens rather than oversimplifying and reworking details later. And that really means thinking through unit, a unit at a time. It's not always happened for me. Sometimes I'll teach something one way and I'll think, oh, well, I, I really, we're about to learn something that kind of messes with something we previously learned. But we can consistently include diversity when applicable. In this example, this is to do with gender again. We learn about meiosis. First, at the beginning of the unit, we, we have to learn about the differences between gender and sex. Students need to know that those are two different things and we need to in every lesson after that, be specific. Are we talking about gender and sex? In this game right here, um, there are some bad things about this game. It's a called the meiosis game by um, Sarah Freeman and Matt Gilbert. It has students kind of deciding, well, what if this cell has disjunction or non-disjunction, deciding how the chromosomes get split up while the cell divides to produce egg and sperm cells. And the purpose of this is for students to kind of mix and match an experiment and see how many different karyotypes you can produce. You can produce people that are XX, XY, XXY, XO, and then there's a bunch of other variations. I'll even challenge students, how many different variations can you create um, out of just the one egg and the one sperm? And so I would always start this by pointing out and saying, hey, you know, we talked about it before, the person that contributes the egg to the zygote, not necessarily always the mother, not necessarily um, the social concept of mother, but we want to understand that in this case, this language from this game in 2007 is flawed and we want to acknowledge that, but we're still going to use the game to our benefit. And we're going to see how variation can occur, disjunction, non-disjunction, chromosomes splitting evenly versus not evenly, that's all naturally occurring. I never talk about variation as something that's inherently bad. We will certainly look at genetic variations that can cause devastating diseases that impact families and parents, but we won't talk about variation as, oh, they split up wrong. There was a mistake in the cell dividing. That's not in general what this is. This is naturally occurring differences and all sex karyotypes, including one that may be considered intersex like XXY, those are all naturally occurring. They don't necessarily affect the person's health. And we wanna see variation as a continually interesting and neutral aspect. We don't need to talk about it as, uh, in this case, it's a mistake or it's negative in some way. I try anytime I introduce a topic immediately to go to that 
diversity. I wouldn't teach about XX and XY and then the next day say, hey, there's you can be XXY because that's showing, okay, these two are privileged. Um, we're going to talk about the exceptions, the weird cases later. And that's not what this is. This is showing um, through a game that variation is all naturally occurring. It's random. And there are multiple combinations of sex chromosomes in this case that we can get. The key here is no very special lessons. And so the talking about diversity is a part of your other lessons. Um, it might mean that lessons are arranged a little bit differently, um, but it makes a really big difference. And students start to expect, well, we're going to learn about all the variations. We're going to learn about like the pattern and then cases that don't follow the pattern all at once, rather than, oh, we'll learn the pattern. I write that down in my notebook. That's what I need to study. Oh, and then later we might talk about these weird exceptions. Um, it's a very different tone there when we have continuity and we integrate diversity into the regular lesson. Um, next in the framework, oh, after all this stuff, next in the framework is affirmation. I really enjoy this part, teaching about diversity in an affirmative way. And in the case of gender in biology, we look at both human and non-human species. This is a clip out of, I think it's the UC Berkeley page on sexual selection. So this would be one of the first things that a student or teacher sees when they Google sexual selection, trying to learn about it at a high school or a college level. You've got three examples here of the same phenomenon, um, species in which the male sex is bigger or flashier and fights for the attention of the females in order to mate with them. So it's the male peacock, there's the elephant seals fighting, there's the grasshopper with the sperm packet, which is trying to show off for the female, and there's the uh, spider um, making a big jump. And these are all real examples, but why show four of the same example out of an entire world of diversity. There are bird species where it's the opposite. The females are larger than the males and their uh, parenting patterns are reversed as well. There are species for which a male and female sex isn't really a way to talk about it, that their genetic makeup doesn't actually determine their sex. There are species where sex is environmentally determined. And it, it was on the AP exam a couple of years ago, environmentally determined sex in fish. A lot of students were caught off guard. They were kind of going crazy on Twitter. Like I, my teacher never taught me about this. I didn't know what to do. When we teach about diversity as perhaps a positive thing, an interesting thing, that really changes the tone. Diversity can be fit and successful when we talk about like fitness and natural selection. It's often the most interesting thing to learn about. This is not getting anybody excited talking about four different examples where the male is big and flashy and competitive. What gets students excited is celebrating diversity. They need to see it in humans and they need to see that it exists in non-human species for biology as well. So um, one thing that your students may have heard of, a good uh, segue here would be clownfish. You've seen Finding Nemo. Um, have you heard that clownfish can change sex and then they'll do so actually in a family situation where the dominant female um, dies by accident, the male or the largest male in the family will physically change sex to female. So that kind of rewrites the narrative of finding Nemo at the beginning that the, I believe Nemo has a, a dad and no mom. Uh, but if this were real life, the dad would have changed sex, undergone sec, uh, sequential hermaphroditism um, in that story. When we look at parenting um, in regards to the fitness of species, Swans are an example where same-sex behavior is documented, naturally occurring, and it's actually documented to increase parenting success. 80% of gay swan couples successfully raise their young compared to 30% of straight swan couples. That's something that students haven't heard of. Um, why shouldn't this be a part of what they learn? 
right? For hyenas, seeing that females in this species have functional penises, they can use them to pee, mount, and give birth. It's not to say that like our LGBTQ students or our trans students, it's not to say that we're trying to compare humans who are diverse to these animal species, but we're elevating this to show that diversity is naturally occurring. And students really identify with this. Um, I had a student last year who we looked at the gay swans, we're talking about fitness, and after she left, I saw that she had written on her desk, um, and I, that's not good, but she wrote, swans are gay, I'm gay, and then a happy face. Um, and I could see that that was one time where she was seeing um, a part of her identity reflected in what we were learning, whereas she might go through a lot of days not seeing that in any class. And so the more that we can show students that diversity is positive aspect, um, the better of an impact that will have. And outside of biology, uh, in chemistry, we have a lot of opportunities to do that as well. Um, at least for me, a lot of my chemistry concepts really pair well with these relationship analogies. Um, so for chemical bonds, which we just finished, we said, well, an ionic bond is um, your two atoms or like your two people in a relationship. Um, it's like a give and take, you know, one person gives gifts, the other takes them, um, giving an electron away. Whereas a covalent bond, they share all their electrons. And so that's like, you know, the couples where they share everything, they share their clothes, they share their passwords for to their Facebook, everything. Um, but we need to make sure that anytime we're talking about relationships, one, students want to understand it's, it's an analogy and that we're being inclusive. And so wouldn't make sense and i've seen some teachers do this to say well it's like the ionic bonds are it's like a man and a woman like the man gives a ring to the woman or something um, that there's no reason to do that students don't need to hear that it doesn't help with the analogy and it makes them realize that they're not seen um, if they are gay or lesbian or bisexual um, similarly a lot of the times to build fluency, I'll do speed dating. Speed dating is something you can do with a lot of it. anything that you want students to build fluency with and also discuss in pairs. So I'd give them all uh, an ion. I say, your calcium, um, you're going to go and speed date and around. You're going to meet with all these anions and you're going to figure out what bond you make together. Um, and when I got to my school, the pre-existing activity on speed dating was um, it, it was split up by gender and it was heterosexual, heteronormative. It was this idea of you are going to um, speed date and we're matching the anions to the cations just like you would match a male to a female. And there's no reason to do that. Um, there's We have capability to learn about all the ions without um, putting that imposition on our students. And so the work that I've done in chemistry with bonds has been to make sure that students recognize that one, these are analogies as you don't have to really want to date the person that you're making an ion with, um, but also that if we're gonna talk about relationships, we wanna talk about it in as broad a way as possible, that relationships can be between any people of any gender. Next, I want to talk about anti-oppression. This is a tough topic. The way that we use science explanations and data to change the status quo. When we look at a textbook image like this, this you can immediately see a lot of weird expectations being put on um, children, having the silhouette, the pigtails, the, the dress, the idea that uh, X-linked traits, that they're going to affect your sons versus your daughters and to make that association um, it's the mothers and the daughters and the sons to connect genetic or physiological sex with our social identity gender identity is we want to be very careful when talking about that with students we have students that don't have a mother and a father that both 
donated half of their DNA to make them. We have students with all kinds of families. And so when this comes up, we take a sec to talk about it. What are the, aside from like how they're trying to show inheritance here, what are the implicit messages in this image? And how does that compare maybe to other kinds of families? And this is a nice poster from the from an Australian project called the Gaby Baby Project, um, highlighting how there's more than one way to make a family. Our students deserve to understand that a social idea of a family, our lived experience of a family is not necessarily this, and that's totally valid, and all of this is valid. I wanna skip over the uh, Lupron stuff and I wanna tell you briefly about a chemistry project that you can do. This was developed by a teacher at Kent Denver School. It's a big stoichiometry project about drug synthesis. Essentially, you're gonna give students um, a fake situation. We got this um, drug that we wanna synthesize that um, treats this particular condition. And were we in the lab uh, in-person class, we would actually synthesize these. They're not really drugs. They don't really help with any particular disease. Um, but the goal of students is to develop a way to synthesize this and to actually track the cost of that, the cost of the R&D, and to look at what goes into drug prices, what's going on in the United States, which a lot of students have heard of, that makes our drug prices high. Is it the way that we are making them in the lab? Is it the law regarding how they need to be priced and distributed? And how does that affect different populations? Look at the most commonly prescribed drugs, diabetes. Um, look at who's usually using that and who is most affected by this differential in price here. And so this is a way that looking at stoichiometry and chemistry can be a window into oppression and how science can be used to fight oppression. I had students develop ways to um, synthesize drugs and kind of compete for who can do it in the most efficient way, who can document that it has a good percent yield, and that if this were a real life drug, that we could market it and we could distribute it. How do you want to distribute it? Is it going to be, uh, are you going to use price discrimination or are you going to um, make the procedure for producing it free for any other company to use? And how would that look in your ideal world? Lastly, after anti-oppression, look at student agency. Any way that you can get students give input on your lessons or even choose the way they want to learn something, um, that works really well with teaching about diversity. Uh, my colleague Lewis has students develop language. He says, well, we've got this thing we want to talk about in biology. One of the two people who contributed DNA to make a new human being. You might say, well, that's genetic parents or birth parents, but there's some flaws with both of these. Uh, birth parent, we have surrogate parents. The person that gave birth to you may not have DNA related to you at all. And so his students came up with a term. Theirs one year was biological life transmitter, BLT. So this is making language that is for a purpose for discussion of students in their class that hasn't existed before because language is always changing and we've shown that by developing our own term. In other years, um, he's said that they have come up with the word stork. Your storks my, are the two people that contributed DNA to make you. Or your gene giver, GG. When students um, have that involvement, that choice, it increases their agency and gets them more interested in talking about diversity in this class. In chemistry, I give a big set of choices for learning about nuclear chemistry. And I try to pick all ones that you might have some interest in looking at. Radium girls, you wanna look at how women were treated in factories and how when they developed cancer from radium, how the uh, factories treated that and how the lawsuits turned out. Los Alamos lawsuit, uh, similar situation. Do you wanna focus on Rosalind Franklin um, as your kind of woman scientist hero there? 
Yucca Mountain, the Bikini Atoll, how have we treated parts of this world as completely disposable and testing out nuclear bombs or the Iran nuclear deal? So coming back to these five elements of the framework, this is something to think about in any lesson, any course of study that's being planned. And I hope that I've showed you a couple of examples, mostly focused on the way I talk about gender, but I hope that you can see how that this can apply to any area of science or even really outside of science when you're thinking about how to teach about diversity. Uh, I wanna end with talking about responding to pushback. Um, we all work in, in different communities and we will have uh, parents, students, maybe other teachers who ask, um, can I take a closer look at what you're doing? Or they might say, really, I don't think this is in the curriculum what you're doing. Um, I encourage folks to have proactive conversations with staff, talk about what you're doing, be proud of what you're doing. Um, don't show that you know, you're looking for permission to do this. Um, and I'll show you a couple of um, organizations that have our back on this as well. You can help to share your content transparently. Uh, when a family emailed me asking, hey, I heard you talk about transgender fish today. I, I wanna know if that's in the curriculum. I sent them the entire packet, the entire slideshow. I said, um, this is what we're doing. We are evidence-based. This is based on best practices. And emphasize how that content is evidence-based. You can also lean on support from some authorities here. The NSTA has a very detailed position statement on gender equity in science education. They really support this work. They have other statements on teaching about race as well on their website. The Next Generation Science Standards also point this out. We gotta understand the context that influences science learning by diverse student groups got to have effective strategies to include all students. And they call out racial, ethnic, cultural, linguistic, socioeconomic, and gender backgrounds. So it's not like, I guess, it's not like we're doing anything rogue here. We are doing something very important and unique, but we are following along guidelines laid down by authorities that are respected in the field. I had some more research here on socially responsible science education. If you want to present a case for the impact of this and what research says on how teachers are doing it and how this can benefit students. In Colorado here at BSCS, that was where a lot of this research is coming out of, um, especially from a researcher called Brian Donovan. Um, they are running pilot studies on teaching about race and biology. So if you want to be involved with that, um, I'm sure they'd be happy to have you be a part of their pilot program. Um, you can click right here to learn about the BSCS programs. Okay, lastly, I want to share how students have responded to this. Um, the answer is generally positive. Um, to be specific, our students have said that in this education, they were reminded not everyone has the same body as you or identifies in the same way, and that's okay. And this was coming from a cisgender person, a cisgender student who um, this experience kind of started him off on the path of understanding those that are different from him. And he's continued to, continued to do that going on in college now. I had a, a student say last year, um, this is the first time that you talked about LGBT relationships or even acknowledged they existed. Um, and that's going through all of elementary and middle school, going through health class, uh, going through advisories, talking about relationships. And he says all teachers need to acknowledge this. These are moments specific to gender and biology. Um, I asked biology students and they gave suggestions. They said, in science class, you should teach the difference between gender and sex when kids are young. To teachers considering teaching more gender inclusive biology, I would say that this could really mean a lot to your students and there's not really any reason not to do it. So just if you think you're gonna make mistakes, if you're worried, um, there's no reason to not do that. There is, we have a lot of opportunity to uh, develop and to learn from mistakes as educators, um, but the sooner you start incorporating these ideas, or I know a lot of you are probably already incorporating a lot of these ideas, 
um, your students will notice. They notice right away. And lastly, the student particularly wanted teachers to tell us intersex people exist and aren't bad. Um, they were, I guess, very frustrated that they had to wait so long to learn about that. If you do teach biology, I want to encourage you to check out our website, genderinclusivebiology.com. It's a resource website with materials made or compiled by myself and two other trans-identified uh, high school science teachers, but the resources are for K to 12 plus. And I hope that you'll also contribute any resources that you know would belong on that website because it's constantly growing. And I want to thank you for joining me to learn today. I'd love to hear your questions and comments in the chat. Um, Trisha, as I understand, we can have, well, we have more time for discussion now. That's right. So folks, if you have questions, you can either drop them into the Q&A. You might see that at the bottom of your toolbar. You're also welcome to put them into the chat. If you are doing that, please make sure that you've selected that blue box and it says panelists and attendees. Uh, and while you're thinking about questions that you would like to ask of Sam, I do want to just link in again, uh, you know, Sam, the work that you're doing is so important, is so relevant, is so necessary. And I was super excited to see the, uh, the Teaching Tolerance Fall 2020 magazine where you were highlighted. So the link to that, folks is in the chat. Um, you know, Sam, I, I don't know that you would have noticed all the positive responses in the chat while you were presenting just all of the thank yous. Uh, and I, I kind of think, you know, again, one of the best ways that, that we can pay it forward is just, you know, I, I love sharing Sam Long's site with, with other teachers. I do think those resources are great. Um, and so just driving a little bit more traffic to that space uh, is a great thing to do. And also just that teaching tolerance, highlighting you as an award recip recipient, because I, you know, I, I appreciate that you, that you spoke to that idea of the pushback. And I kind of think when I juxtapose the reality that you have to deal with that and that many teachers have to deal with that with, you know, hey, this is award-winning education. This is the, the direction that we need to be going in and, and that's being recognized. Um, you know, as, as Tim just said in the chat, it's really thought provoking. So I, I kind of like to pair, pair those things together. So if you do have a question, please let us know about it in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, I also appreciate just other folks echoing their thanks and appreciation for the work that you do. Um, I'll also just mention really quickly, as those thank yous are coming through, the Reimagine team and the Shifting Schools team is doing something a little bit different this time around. Um, we you know, kind of appreciate what a tough year this is for educators. Um, and it, it's been great just to see week after week folks turning up for these sessions. And we wanted to try and offer something as a little bit of a thank you for that. So um, the team at Shifting Schools actually has a new upcoming resource called Empowering PLCs. I put the link to that in the chat. And we're going to do a little bit of a, a giveaway for that. So if you're interested in that empowering PLCs, it's basically a facilitator's guide with a reflective journal for you to bring back to your school to strike up some, some professional learning conversations. If you are interested in entering to win that, the Google form to enter that is there. So each week now we're gonna, we're gonna pick one of our audience members to give that to. So the, the Google form, if you'd like to enter, is there for you in the chat. If you're watching the recording of this video or listening to the podcast, sorry, you do have to be here live to enter. That's really cool. Thank you for sharing that opportunity that Shifting Schools has there. Oh, we're just, you know, again, like we're really thankful for, for educators who are, are working so incredibly hard during this time. Uh, we do have a question in the chat from Sarah, who, Sam, this was a question that I asked at, the, oh, at yeah. the start before we got going. The image behind you is so beautiful. I think lots of us have enjoyed looking at it. Um, do you want to explain where you got that image? It's from Unsplash, which is a free uh, photography website, unsplash.com. Um, it is, I don't know where it comes from, but what I was looking for was a landscape of mountains with a general pink hue because I wanted for change in color. Um, so I'm not sure, but based on the evidence of the way the houses looked, I was saying that it looks like they're like pop-up houses, like they're not 
in a foundation on the ground. So it makes me think it's somewhere on the tundra where the ground's frozen and you can't build that way. Sam, and I'm realizing as you're explaining that, like what a cool little, you know, I, I love that you talked about some of the mystery behind science and, and getting our learners wondering. And, you know, that idea of solving a mystery just is really appealing. And I kind of feel like you could even do that with your virtual background image. Um, and Unsplash is a great tool. I love it. They also have a Google Chrome extension for those of you who make a lot of slide presentations that add on lets you just really nicely grab some of their beautiful uh, free ready to use resources to add. It's way better than Google Images um, mm -hmm. if you want photography, um, really high quality. So I think if we don't have any other questions, Sam, we're not gonna take any more of your time this afternoon. Again, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I can't wait to go back through the slides and just comb through those resources that you've compiled for us. I feel like there is so much there. Uh, and just, you know, thank you for all of the connections that, that you've helped us made and, and really, you know, for reframing the power of science, of the science classroom. Um, as an opportunity for advocacy, for anti-oppression work, for equi equity work, I really think that there's so much power in thinking more and asking questions about whether or not our science classrooms are living up to that potential. So thank you for giving us the tools to take that further. And folks who turned in, uh, turned up, thank you so much. Uh, we do get the recording of this typically up on our website about 24 hours later and the link to Sam's brilliant slides that are just absolutely full of resources will be there too. Thank you so much, Sam Long. Thank you for having me. I'll have a great afternoon or evening. I know you'll be thinking about like ways to integrate some of these things um, and have a restful break coming up as well if you're doing Thanksgiving. Thanks everybody. Take care.